magnificent town hall like this one here at Bolton is a grand example of Victorian civic pride. The success and prosperity that the Industrial Revolution brought to towns like this left us with some magnificent buildings. Just look at the fancy work on there. You know? We love to have everything ornate and quite beautiful to look at, you know, pleasing to the eye. The actual ornamentation were almost as important as the building itself. I mean, it definitely was the great age of Victorian splendour. <laughs> Fred Dibner was, by his own admission, a man born out of his time. He always said he should have been born in the Victorian age. It's the age he admired, the time he would like to have lived and worked. His appreciation of the architectural and decorative skills of the age went back to his first job. I first became interested in buildings, uh, you know, when I was about 15 years old. And of course, I lived here in this small terraced house. And this wall is one of the first things I ever built. The thing is, my mother and father wanted me to be an undertaker. Now, I didn't fancy that, you know, so I got on my bicycle and I pedalled off to the Youth Employment Bureau where they fixed me up with a job as a joiner. My work as a joiner got me into some of the splendid mansions that the cotton mill owners and bleach works owners had built. This actual house was built by a bleach works owner. The thing is, I couldn't help but notice, having come from an house that hadn't got any skirting boards, you know, the quality of the woodwork and the height of the skirting boards, 18 inches up the walls, and the beautiful panel doors and architraves, and best of all, the fancy plastered ceilings, you know. Made me wonder, you know, how ever did they do it, you know. Of course, it's a pub now, so really, everybody can enjoy it. He did have Victorian values. I think the biggest uh, emphasis on what he appreciated about Victorian values was the quality. Everything was made to a, a very high standard. Most things were made by hand, and that is what he appreciated the most, that everything looked the part and everything was built to last. Everything had a job and it did it for generations. What you see in here, though, you know, they're really all done just to be looked at, you know. Things like the smallest details, you know, had to be beautiful. I mean, even if it were a great big thing, like a civil engineering piece, they still made a fuss of it, you know what I mean? But in houses, you know, the, the minute detail, right down to things like window catches, uh, were always quite beautiful. For Fred, it was these high standards that made Britain lead the world. Fred was proud to be British, and he was proud of the, of the achievements of Great Britain. Uh, and I think that really this country has gone through huge changes, two devastating world wars which bankrupted the country uh, and the loss of empire. There's a lot, an awful lot of psychological adjustment necessary to build the new Britain that we all live in now. And I think that maybe people were abashed to talk about those great days when Britain was so confident uh, and really was the premier power in the whole world. It's good that Fred was able to say that, and not only say it, but to say it with pride and enthusiasm. And associate with a Victorian age in everything he did. Nowhere can this be seen better than in his own house in Bolton. John Gawley was Fred's boiler inspector, and in the course of his work, he became a regular visitor to the house. He was a great admirer of uh, Victorian architecture, and uh, he liked to look at it and talk to people about it. He was very good at um, that type of brickwork. Obviously, it's an extension of uh, chimney repairing. But uh, even his house, the extension to it, he, uh, he got the bricks from uh, dis demolished uh, terraced houses that were uh, in Bolton, uh, of the same vintage as the rest of his house. And uh, he did a lot of extra stonework on that house, which is quite beautiful to behold. So yes, he, he had quite an interest in architecture. It's this that I like about the Victorian era, you know. That's why I've got so much of this sort of stuff here in my house, you know. I mean, this wonderful bit here uh, came off the front of a shop somewhere. And uh, you couldn't see it, of course, for the paint, the detail. 
So I, I boiled it up in caustic and all the paint come off, revealing all this lovely fancy work. It's made of pots actually, terracotta. And then, like the wonderful age of Victorian gaslighting, like this magnificent thing here, um, you know, which uh, the trouble that they went to, you know, and of course you can swing the thing about. Like, I wonder, you know, there must have been lots of gas leaks uh, from all the various joints and taps. I mean, some of them I've seen were like three arms on, so you could more or less move the thing any way you wanted. If you look at Fred's house, a lot of it, there was a lot of Victoriana about. He liked the old way of doing things. Um, he was very much a perfectionist in everything that he did, and I think all of us that play with steam engines, we all live in the past a bit. But yeah, Fred, he, it, everything to do with the, with sort of the Victorian era, he was interested in. It's all handmade by craftsmen, and nothing was machine made, and you know that's why he liked it so much. It is an age, the Victorian age, when engineers and mechanics were, you know, looked up to a bit. I think I'd like to have lived then, you know, when we made things like this. Uh, you know, the modern equivalent wouldn't be as beautiful as this. You can imagine going to work every morning and, and you know, making these, you know, would have been quite a pleasurable do. I suppose they got a bit sick, but, you know, um, I think I'd sooner make these than Inges for car doors or someone on that score, you know, uh, that, you know, you, you don't even know which bloody car they're going on. Um, the, there was something about it when, in the great age of steam, we led the world and made all the beautiful bits for these things. I think he was very good on exactly that point, because although I think we do all now think it's a good thing we don't have an empire and go around the world telling everybody what to do, but the other side of that was a very great kind of generosity on the part of the Victorians, a great sense of civic pride, which Fred always brought out, whether he was looking at a town hall or a park, all those things the Victorians gave us, as well as town halls. He talked about mechanics institutes, but they gave us the swimming bars, the libraries, the public open spaces, all the things we're letting go again. And he was very good at emphasising that. And Fred never missed an opportunity to show us the glories of the Victorian age. So, when he went to visit the Lloyds building in London, he made sure he showed us the beautiful Victorian market next to it. Right in the shadow of this great stainless steel and glass and, and concrete construction, there's a wonderful market, Victorian market, Leadenhall market, all made of cast iron and timber and what have you. You know, the Victorians went to great lengths to make things very beautiful as well as functional. The whole place is an iron founder's dream, you know, all the beautiful columns and the ornamental corbels and all the flowery bits will all be over. And inside, they'll be behind where nobody can see. There'll be big rectangular shaped holes, and then joining the ends together, there'll be millions of nuts and bolts holes. And the whole thing will be held together with nuts and bolts. You know, it's quite a wonderful thing, really, when you when you think about it. Um, the, the, all these lovely wrought iron bars would once have had sides of beef hanging down and all of that sort of thing. It must have been an interesting place then, I rather think. Oh, I think he would have done very well in the Victorian age. He had that absolutely Victorian mixture of being very keen on progress, very keen on getting things done, very keen on thinking through problems, and at the same time this complete fascination with the past and a great sympathy with the past. And the Victorians were always looking to the Middle Ages, building new buildings in a Gothic style, but, as, as Fred showed, you know, all full of cast iron, all full of the latest technology. And I think his enthusiasm and his ingenuity, his way of thinking things through, uh, would have made him a very successful Victorian. Eastner Castle in Herefordshire was built for the first Earl Summers in the first half of the 19th century. Its architect, Robert Smirk, designed it to look like a great medieval castle. When Fred visited it, he was able to show us this marriage of Gothic style and modern technology, as he raised the questions we all want to ask when we visit a great building like this. How could they make the archways so big? I 
How could they vault such a large cavernous space like this without using massive structural timbers? I could think of several sort of television presenters who'd go and visit somewhere like Easton Castle because it's a large, large posh country house. But I think Fred's the only one I can think of who'd, who'd go and look in the roof space uh, because it has some of the earliest large cast iron roof trusses, which are fantastically interesting because he's quite right, they're the most important thing about that house. Um, but it would take Fred to see that, I think. So, Fred, this is the biggest cast iron beam we've got in the house. And this was fitted in 1818, just as the castle mm. was being topped yeah. out. And you can imagine in a much older building, there would have been a massive stone vault to support mm. the Big superstructure. Arc. We do know who the people were who actually yeah, they reckon were. they did the job, Mr. Penn and Mr. Worth, yeah. the joiners. Well, I mean, it's yeah. amazing there's only two of them. They must have yeah. been fantastic yeah. men. If They'd be the ones who were sign. literate, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> they could write. Could write. <laughs> There'd be a big army of labourers as well, yeah, you exactly. know. Mr. Smirk made very clever use of cast iron, you know, not only in the, in the structure or for structural purposes, but the ornamental side of it. I mean, if you look at this staircase, it looks as though it's made of wood, you know, but in actual fact, if you look more closely, you can see this that looks like carved wood is actually cast iron. And of course, the way that they would do this is to make, first of all, a wooden pattern and bury that in the sand in a moulding box and then pour in the molten iron. The great beam that we looked at up in the rafters will be made in exactly the same way, but on a much mightier scale. When you think about it, when you're having building work done, the plasterers and the tilers and the joiners are as important as the men who actually built the place. Once Eastner Castle had been built, they proceeded with the interior work and it was all pretty lavish. This is the Gothic drawing room, which was redecorated in 1849. And for me, this is the height of Victorian splendour and embellishment. And it's a very fine example of how good they were at decorating places back in them days. The man responsible for the room was the architect and designer, Augustus Welby Pugin. I think the great impression you get from Fred's programmes is his enthusiasm and that was a very strong Victorian idea that if you put enough energy into something, if you really worked hard at it, if you really loved it, then, then you would succeed. And I think that there's a great sense nowadays that you, know, you can do things without, without a lot of effort and he knew that it did take effort to produce these amazing machines and buildings that he, he loved so much. What Fred tells us about Pugin is not just to look at the outside of the building, but to look on the inside of the building, and that it's a complete design space. Pugin was having to deal with very new technologies in, in many ways. You know, how do you make a, a gas fitting? How do you make um, a, a, a whole suite of tables, for example? You need 100 tables, all in different designs. How do you deal with these design problems, but yet keep them within uh, a consistent style. So he's asking questions all the time about how do you apply style to function. And I think this is the key to Victorian architecture, that it's not just about the ornament on the outside, it's about what holds it up and what is it use, used for. Nowhere can this be seen better than at one of our greatest monuments to the Victorian age, Tower Bridge. Inside that great castle-like exterior there's a great big steel frame that were constructed by the same men who built the fourth bridge. It took eight years to build and five different major contracting companies and the relentless labour of 500 men and about there's about 11,000 tonnes of steel in the in the towers and the walkways and the roadways. On the completion of the steelwork it was clad in Cornish granite and Portland stone both to protect the ironwork and give it the beautiful appearance that it has now. Yeah, when you come inside one of the towers, you know, you can see it's great steel skeleton, you know, that's all riveted together. The whole thing would stand up really without the fancy stonework or the beautification on the outside, you know. It's a wonderful bit of ironwork really, you know. Let's do some riveting, you know. <laughs> 
Fred was very good at looking at things which were very famous. I mean, he could look at Tower Bridge and make you feel you'd never seen it before. And people have heard of Pugin, they've all heard of the Palace of Westminster, and he showed us the House of Lords and all of that. But I think for most people, Pugin is just a name, a name associated with some very expensive wallpaper recently. Um, but because he went off and he looked at Eastmer Castle, he looked at St Giles Cheadle, St Giles Cheadle is a wonderful church, but it's in quite a small town in Staffordshire, and I think a lot of people don't realise that they might have a world-class work of art in their own town, just round the corner, 20 minutes' drive away. And I think that kind of programme makes people feel that, yeah, they can go and see these things. Pugin called St Giles his gem, the finest church he ever designed. And I'm inclined to agree with him in some ways, you know, because... He's really gone to town with a fancy look, you know, but there's something about artists and designers like him. You know, you can't get away from the same squiddly bits that keep cropping up everywhere, in House of Commons, um, East New Castle, everywhere, you know, these beautiful tiles. Even the same designs transferred over into the central eating grating, you know. And when you look behind me, this lovely screen and it's pan vaulting, Reminds me of the, the wood holding the lantern up at the Ely Cathedral. And sort of all everywhere there's all this wonderful Gothic ornamentation. Even up on the roof, you know, like it, it, the ridge tiles are made of cast iron and they're almost identical to the ones on the Houses of Parliament. It's as though he's constantly going back to the Middle Ages. I'm always astonished at the way in which he moves from the very grand scale of buildings or, or engineering projects right down to the small scale of the details of the decoration. And what he shows us is that these are all part of the same system that the Victorians had set up. So they were interested in getting things to work wonderfully smoothly, but they also wanted them to be beautiful. And I think Fred shows us through a number of things that he's got in his own collection something like a lavatory system bracket. You know, that's a small scale object. It's nothing fancy, but it's something that somebody took some care about. Even these humble brackets, you know, started life off holding the cistern up in a toilet, you know, in the spinning mill. And I uh, just remember there's another pair there. I think I'll go back for them because they're rather elegant, aren't they? Beautifully made, you know, cast iron. They don't seem nowadays reproduction cast iron. Never seems as nice and fine as though when the Victorians did it. And it's this idea of, of wanting to put effort again into what you're making, what you're doing, making, making it special, making it individual, making it personal. And I think that that is the, the key to both to the Victorians in many ways, but also to how Fred talks to us. And what he related to best was the sort of small-scale domestic architecture, like all the Victorian features here in the houses of Beamish Open Air Museum. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Rather a splendid parlour you've got here, eh? It's very nice. Yeah, it's like a bit of a cut above the others, isn't it, with the semicircular arches and the... Uh, I've got a fireplace like that at home in one of my bedrooms. Oh, uh, you're lucky. Yeah, it's about 1850, I would mm. think, that that thing were made. Yeah. Uh, and all, and the lovely sash windows with yep. the panelling and uh, the shutters and everything. Yep. This is quite posh, isn't it? Yes, it's, this is uh, some uh, a bit, rather uh, superior residence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see, there's, there's not even any gas lamps, is there? It's no. only like oil lamps, still on the oil, you know. No, no, they're and them a bit old-fashioned we are. Splendid ceiling rows there, eh, but, uh, yeah, very, very beautiful. Mm. Mm. Yeah, my mother wanted me to learn to play the piano, mm -hmm. but I never uh, Very got round to going. Yeah, my brother went, and mm -hmm. the piano forte teacher used to say to me, why don't you come instead? You'd be better at it than he is. <laughs> ah, good morning. This is a bit, bit like home good from morning. home for me, this. Like, really, the, the Victorian cast iron fire grate is like the, the centre of the household. You know, everything happened here. The bread were baked and all the boiling water come out and it dried all the clothes on the rail here. It's quite a fascinating thing. It was Victorian through and through, Fred, and he had certain ideas. He'd expect his uh, wife to behave and uh, respond. 
say, for instance, if his meal wasn't on the table at a certain time, he'd be quite cross, or uh, you know, he might expect that uh, you, you, you should have the house spotless and even bake bread. But of course, there's only so many hours in a day that you can do, and uh, he'd go out and moan to people that, uh, whoa, well, you know, I'm not having bloody tea yet, like. Do you do this often, dear? <laughs> Once a week. <laughs> Once a week. Yeah, I'm, I've actually got one at home that's uh, a bit older than this, and, uh, and I, I mastered a way of uh, doing the black wedding with an electric drill, you know, with a mop on end, you know. Makes life a bit easier. It's quite a technical one, this, isn't it? it it's got all these lovely, at least for working the dampers and things. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Moffat Brothers, eh? Gates said. Yes, it's a Gates head on tying. Yeah, you've got quite a few uh, labour-saving devices in here, don't you? That's for cleaning knives, isn't it? Yes, because there was uh, steel there. One, but it's not in as good a neck as yours. <laughs> I remember him talking about um, how you could see the letters co-op on any high street at one point in the 19th century. And I think that's the kind of thing a lot of people will have seen on their own high street and walked past it a million times. And then when you've seen Fred's programme, you walk past it and you think, oh, right, that's what he was talking about. He made sense, I think, of a lot of the, the built environment that people have got very used to. Like the, the original quap business started off in Rochdale in 1844. It sort of mushroomed into an England-wide organisation. That In the end, they had their own architects and their own builders and the beautiful structures that they did. You know, they always stood out in, like in Lancashire in a poor mill neighbourhood, you know, there were always this beautiful building, the Co-op, and they always had a beautiful plaque on, you know, the Farmworth and Kersley Cooperative Society or the Bolton Cooperative Society, and of course it went on and on until it got that big, I don't think they could manage it. And of course the architecture, these lovely, they were like wooden inside of a big wooden box, they were all the same with lovely T and G board in with lovely beadings down the edge. Mm. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah, this is the quap. It reminds me of when I was little, all this lot in here, you know, when I used to go to the quap in just around the corner from where we lived. There's only one difference. There's some white cloth bags hanging out of the ceiling. What the flower come down. They've got the same thing here, but it's in a tin box in the corner, I've noticed. You know, the, um, and they even have one of these for cutting black twist in half. Like a guillotine, you know. Um, health and safety job, I don't know what they'd say about that. Mm. Ah. Now then, Malcolm, <laughs> I know what you're doing, but yeah. these lot at the other end of here don't, do they? Yeah. Well, I'm going to send the money by using a system which will take the ball and yeah. lift it up onto the trap, yeah. which will then forced down by gravity and it runs into the cash office. There was a similar contraption to this in the co-op in Bolton when I was a little lad, but it worked off either a vacuum or a compressed air. But it did exactly the same thing, you know, it made life a lot easier for the guy behind the counter, you know. Here you've got all sorts of interesting stuff in here. You cater for the mining men as well, didn't yes, you? Yes, we have our miners shovels. Yeah, yeah, big Also, flat. we have the picks. Yeah. The men had to buy their own equipment. Mm. Yeah. They were on good wages then, contrary to what a lot of people think. Yes, you know, it's, they it's had, a little uh, bit different. Yeah. It was a funny occupation, really. It varied so much, didn't it, in, depending on the, the price of coal and it's, who would fall in. In this area, it was all yeah. mines, and yeah. coal was actually mm. king at the time. Mm. Mm. So it was the dependent on how much the coal was selling for, yeah. miners would get paid. Mm. He looked at Victoria in gold watch, chain, waistcoat and so on. But also in his uh, views of the world, he, uh, he believed in um, the worth et ethic. Uh, he believed that uh, money should only be made by hard labour, basically. And he wasn't too keen on the way money is made these days, which is not always directly through work. His contribution to how we lived, I think, was a particular understanding of how the industrial working classes lived and what was expected of them because he was just old enough to have heard old people talking about the age before the welfare state, the age before um, a real caring about housing quality. And 
I think, um, in his odd little asides, um, he's making clear that the good old days weren't always good, but they were heroic. At Beamish, they've recreated a complete pit village with the winding engine, the headgear, the washeries, the engine sheds, the village school, the Methodist chapel, that means no drinking. But last but not least, a beautiful row of cottages, Pittman's cottages, just like they used to be. Mm. Considering like this is a Pittman's cottage, you know, it's very small, but they've made very good use of the space, you know, sort of thing. I mean, that in there is the parlour with the beautiful elliptical table. And, and of course, just round the corner, there's a double bed, you know. You have to be ill before you move the bed into the parlour in Lancashire, but it must have been common round here. So the bed and the parlour all in the same thing. And of course, I think the kids were upstairs, you know, up in the roof space. And in here, this is the kitchen, and this is Denise who's doing this wonderful peg rug. <laughs> Well, a peg rug to you, but a proggy mat to us. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember my mum doing things like that after the war, you know, when times right. were hard. Yeah. That, of course, is the fireplace with the oven. Uh, and that round oven is particularly noted for its locality. You know, you only ever see them in, in northeast of England, never anywhere else. Everywhere else, they're all square or rectangular shaped. I know I've got one somewhat similar. Uh, with same sort of handle but a, a square door. A lot of people still use the word Victorian as a term of abuse. It's pejorative. You know, we, we blame the Victorians for so many of society's ills today. You know, the way we live in our cities, the things that we've done to our countryside, the way that our factory systems work. We seem to think that the Victorians should have been more far-sighted. They should, they should have been more politically correct, I suppose. And I think that Fred by drawing attention to their, their great achievements um, makes us realise that it wasn't all dark satanic mills. I do think that though there can sometimes be a problem in the programmes that it is very celebratory of the past and very subjective in the way that he talks about the past. And I think that there are times when you, when you look at a worker's cottage in Beamish and it's all spick and span, and you think, well, actually, what would it be like when somebody comes back from the from the coal mine and they're still grubby and they've got six kids and they've got to feed them? And you know, you you do slightly wonder whether it is a bit a bit rose tinted, and that the reality of of working in a mine or working in a factory, even though you are surrounded by beautiful machinery which is all highly decorated, it might have been rather less pleasant than than some of the programmes give you. Uh, give you the idea about. He didn't want to preserve the fact that folks were living on a pittance, and, uh, you know, in, in, in houses with no modern facilities. It wasn't that that he wanted to preserve. It was just purely the craftsman's side of the job, the way things were designed and built. Fred shows his love of the Victorian age a great deal through his appreciation of what he could see. I mean, he looked at uh, pumping engines being a thing of great beauty, for example, in water supply. And you can look at the aesthetics of a piece of Victorian engineering when things were made where form and function went hand in hand, whereas now we're very much a sort of throwaway society where something is made to do a job here and now and not much thought has gone towards what it looks like. The Victorians had that sense of aesthetics and I think that appealed to Fred a great deal and he was able to show the public through his programmes that appeal as well uh, to see that you know these things didn't only look well they performed well and they lasted a very long time. I wonder if they'll let us have a go at uh, you know playing with the handles. <laughs>